So I felt as a documentary filmmaker, one of my contributions could be to document these protests that, of course, caught the attention of the authorities, not just the university administration. While I'm dismissed, I'm also banned from the campus. Mm -hmm. So I've become a persona non grata. Turkey is about to become a country that produces nuclear energy and nuclear waste. How did we come to this point? And where do we want to go from here? Welcome to Pop and Politics, your guide to art and culture in Turkey. I'm your host, Kenan Besat Sharp. Each week we host an artist, musician, director, writer or actor, and today we are joined by Jan Jandan, an independent filmmaker and academic. Since 1989, his films have been screened internationally at festivals, conferences and galleries. He is most well known for Duvar Maren Walls in 2000, about the Turkish immigrant community in post-Wall Berlin, and My Child from 2013, a future documentary on the parents of LGBTIQ plus individuals in Turkey. In 2016, he was one of the many signatories of the Academics for Peace Declaration, calling on the Turkish government to end the violence against the Kurdish population in the southeast of the country. He was tried under the anti-terror law and faced a minimum sentence of 15 months. Following the Constitutional Court's ruling in favor of freedom of speech in 2019, he was acquitted of all charges. Jandan has also long taught at Boğaziçi University in Istanbul and has been an important part of the resistance to the government-appointed rector there. His current film project is Nuclear Ala Turka, a documentary on the history of atomic and nuclear energy in Turkey. Jan Jandan, welcome and thank you for coming to the program. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's, it's my a pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, so I want to ask first about uh, your film, My Child. So for me, and I think some other people as well, it was the first time you know we encountered your work. Um, can you tell us about your motivations for first making the film and also what the reception of it has been like and the responses in the almost 10 years since it came out? Sure. Um, the story of My Child goes back to the year 2010. Uh, I was teaching at Boğaziçi University at the time. And there was a conference organized by our uh, cultural studies graduate program. Uh, the title of the conference was uh, Queer and Trans Identity in Turkey. And when I received the program of the conference in my mailbox, uh, one panel really caught my attention. Um, it was going to be a panel where parents of LGBTIQ plus uh, people would talk about their experiences. And this was something really new for me. I mean, somebody who has been in the human rights movement for a long time, who has been um, an active supporter of LGBTIQ plus rights, I had never encountered parents talking about their experiences. Mm. So I was very curious and I went to this uh, panel and um, I was sitting in the audience. And as the parents were telling their stories, I felt extremely moved by these stories because I was there as a as an adult child listening to these stories and these stories brought me back to my own childhood and uh, I was uh, remembering my own relationship with my uh, parents as a, as a child um, and every child I think each child uh, tries to be themselves in that relationship and that in that relationship I think the family, uh, whether it's consciously or unconsciously or semi-consciously, I think imposes certain expectations that come from the society. And the individual tries to be, the child individual tries to be uh, themselves. Um, so the other part was I was sitting there as a parent, uh, as someone who has, uh, who, who has a child. And uh, these stories were uh, making me reflect on my own parenting. Uh, so, um, you know, in a way, the stories were hitting me from both sides, mm. so to speak. And uh, I was so moved that I, I was in tears. At the same time, I was, I was thinking about, you know, the context in which these stories were being shared. We're in Turkey, uh, a country that uh, unfortunately uh, has uh, experienced a lot of homophobia and transphobia. And, uh, and here were these people openly, publicly talking about their experiences. I felt this was quite uh, a, a revolution in a way. And I felt like more people had to hear these stories 
And uh, as a documentary filmmaker, uh, I immediately decided, because I was so moved, that I should make a film. I had no idea that <laughs> I was going to make this film, but in that short amount of time, I had decided that I should make this film. And I approached them after the panel and I introduced myself, and they said, uh, you know, that that they were uh, waiting for this, actually, mm -hmm. uh, which was a big shock for me, because usually, you know, when you approach people uh, to make documentaries about them, they don't say, we've been waiting for you. But they really wanted it. They really wanted it. Uh, they were ready for it. Uh, some years ago, they had been to Italy uh, and they had seen another film there about the parents' organization in Italy. And they were very inspired and they wanted to have their own documentaries made. And that was how the film project, in a way, began in that uh, room uh, in 2010. And since then, you know, we've been uh, on a journey in a way, mm. uh, first uh, making the film and then uh, showing the film for the almost last 10 years. The film was premiered in uh, February 2013 and the reception has been extremely, um, uh, um, extremely good. I mean, we, we didn't ex expect to have such a, a, you know, good reception in, in, in Turkey. The, Press was very supportive. Audiences uh, were very interested in seeing a film like this. And we really enjoyed over the last 10 years uh, a great support uh, from kind of from the from the general public and, and press especially. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's really wonderful. It's a really powerful project. Thank you. And I think a lot of people can see their own experiences, you know, reflected there, which is why it resonates so much with people. Um, so I want to ask about Boazici. So you are a beloved professor there, and you've also been a key part of the faculty resistance uh, against the government-appointed rector. And I'm wondering if you can tell our viewers who don't know much about it, both um, about what's happened and also how it's affected you personally. And I think also, you know, one of the reasons perhaps you've been targeted is because you've had a very active role in documenting the struggle. Mm -hmm. So besides how it's affected you, I'm also curious about what you think the role of, of documenting or witnessing mm -hmm. uh, is for, for social movements like this. Um, yeah, so um, it's been almost uh, 23 months right now. Uh, it was the beginning of the year in 2021 when we received news that uh, a government up, uh, appointed director was going to be the new rector, uh, and uh, that was something that uh, was not un that was not acceptable to us because um, not only it is unconstitutional that the uh, the, the the president of the university is uh, appointed by the government without um, you know any say from the university, but also it's clearly against uh, the principles of the university, which were uh, declared in the year 2012 by the university senate. Uh, in short, uh, those principles are, ha have to do with um, institutional autonomy of the university, about academic freedoms, and about uh, democratic values that we practice at the university. Uh, we had um, a bottom-up uh, management uh, administration at the university, and the government wants it to, uh, to become a top-down um, administration or management. Um, so, Beginning with uh, January 2021, uh, we started uh, resisting this uh, appointment and saying we do not accept and we do not uh, give up. And that has been our motto. Um, and um, what has been going on is that all the stakeholders of Boazji University, academics, students, alumni, um, the other employees, and um, supporters of Boazji University have come together and voiced their opposition to this appointment. And uh, so um, one of the things that we've been doing is as faculty, uh, at noon every workday, we stand with our backs turned at the rectorate building and we stand there in silence uh, uh, for about 15 minutes and hold this vigil and, and today, it was the 465th vigil wow. that took place. Mm -hmm. And um, from the beginning of the resistance, uh, because I'm a documentary filmmaker, and because uh, one of the first things that they did was that they banned uh, the press from the campus. So the press wasn't able to uh, enter the campus and document mm -hmm. what was going on or make uh, news about it. 
so I felt as a documentary filmmaker, one of my uh, contributions could be um, to document uh, these uh, uh, protests. And that's what I did. I mean, uh, every day I went to the vigil, I took photographs, I filmed the vigil, and I made these images and uh, recordings uh, uh, widely uh, available, both to the public and to the press. Mm -hmm. And that, also, that, of course, caught the attention uh, of the authorities, not just the, uh, I think, uh, university administration, but, mm. but um, the authorities also in, in Ankara. Um, well, I think documenting and sharing these images and sounds are very important because I think people need not just the stories of the resistance, but also the pictures and sounds of the resistance. I think it's really powerful when you see um, you know, tens of um, um, university uh, professors in their gowns standing in silence for 15 minutes with mm. their backs turned at the rectorate building. I think it's a very powerful image. And the fact that it's been going on for 465 uh, times so mm. far uh, for the last 23 months, uh, I think really shows that we're really not going to uh, give up. Uh, because mm. we feel like we're responsible to ourselves, we're responsible to academia uh, in general, we're responsible uh, to the people of this country and to our students, uh, uh, of course. Uh, so uh, one of the things that happened personally is that um, uh, last year, J July 2021, uh, they decided not to extend uh, my contract. Um, although I'm a full-time faculty person, um, I was uh, uh, working on a contract uh, basis mm -hmm. because of uh, my uh, status, academic uh, status. And um, so they decided to uh, get rid of me. And how long <laughs> so, have you been teaching there when that happened? 14 years. 14 years, yeah. 14 years without any problems, of course. Uh, so they, 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 I was dismissed with some bogus charges. Um, and then I immediately, of course, uh, started a legal battle. Um, and then finally, the court uh, first uh, issued a stay of execution mm -hmm. on this dismissal, and then they reinstated me uh, to my position. But the funny thing happened, uh, uh, last summer, I was dismissed once again. So <laughs> for the second time, uh -huh. I'm kind of going through the same process of mm. taking this decision to court uh, and waiting for the court to, uh, you know, uh, reinstate me. Uh, but another uh, uh, funny thing is happening. While I'm dismissed, I'm also banned from the campus. Mm. So I've become a persona non grata. So you can't uh, enter campus I at can't the even enter the campus, uh, even though, you know, I've been invited to uh, I've been invited as a guest lecturer. I've been invited to conferences. I've been invited to film screenings, and uh, they're not allowing me uh, onto the campus. And and uh, that has been going on uh, since uh, 16th of August right now. Mm. Um, so I attend the courses online, <laughs> and uh, but but it's really strange to be able to you know, uh, go to any university in Turkey and give talks and give lectures, attend screenings, but not be able to go uh, to my own university. Yeah. But I'm sure that this will, uh, the court will, uh, you know, issue an order for my reinstatement and I will be back on campus. Uh, but the sad thing is uh, I haven't been able to teach uh, for the for the last uh, three semesters right mm. now. And that I feel is a really, um, uh, a misuse of public funds. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for explaining that. Um, I also want to ask about your documentary work a bit more. I know you're working, and you have been working for a while, on a on a film called Nuclear Ala Turka, mm -hmm. and I wanted to see if you could tell us about the idea for making this project. I know nuclear energy is a really hot topic in Turkey because of certain projects that are being planned, but I also want to ask about the name. What is Ala Turka mm -hmm. uh, about? The government's approach to nuclear energy. Sure. Sure. Um, well, uh, I had this film in mind for a long time because I was uh, in Istanbul when Chernobyl disaster took place. And I lived, uh, I was very young at that time, but um, I lived through this experience of public officials trying to deceive the public and not in a way take care of our uh, uh, safety and health. 
uh, we were not informed adequately about what was happening uh, in Chernobyl and how this particular part of the world was being affected by Chernobyl. And since then, obviously, we have lived uh, the consequences of Chernobyl. Of course, because um, the Black Sea is so close to exactly, this travel. Exactly, and the, and the fallout from Chernobyl actually first went westward to um, Eastern Europe and Western Europe. But then a few days later, in early May, the fallout from Chernobyl came southwards mm. and, and entered Turkey. And Turkey was under the radioactive clouds for a few days. And, and that really affected the crops and the environment at that time. And uh, I think we're living through the results uh, of it uh, with the increase of cancer rates in certain areas. Mm. Anyhow, so uh, having lived that experience, um, um, I was always intrigued at, um, you know, why this was happening. Uh, how come we were deceived and how we were deceived? Um, because when you say uh, Chernobyl in Turkey, one of the things that come to people's minds, especially people who lived through that era, is tea. 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 Hmm. Uh, hence the logo of the film. Uh, which is a tea glass shot from above. Uh, and um, tea because uh, Black Sea region is, is where uh, tea is grown. And early May was the beginning of the first tea harvest. Mm. So the first tea harvest was really affected by, um, by the fallout from Chernobyl. And the people uh, in power at that time uh, tried to reassure people that tea was safe. And in order to do that, they were drinking tea on television and in front of the cameras and saying that tea is safe. Well, maybe there could be a little bit of radiation, but it's good for you. <laughs> it's good for health. It's good for your, you know, um, uh, bones, et cetera, et cetera. It was so, politicians saying this stuff? Exactly. Mm. It was politicians saying this stuff. And it's really absurd. I mean, it's really uh, tragicomical. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is the kind of the beginning of the, the idea for this film. Um, uh, because it was really Allah Turka in the sense that I, obviously the word Allah Turka has two meanings. One is, you know, more of a neutral meaning that means like in Rondo, Allah Turka in Mozart's uh, work, for example, uh, means Turkish style, mm -hmm. which is neutral. But then there's another meaning that we use in Turkish, especially, which uh, has to do with a, a more pejorative meaning. That's a, that means uh, that something's backwards, mm. unprofessional, uh, disorganized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think the name uh, sh um, points to both uh, meanings of the word mm. uh, Allah Turka. And the film is about, well, I mean, I decided to start the film in 2015 uh, when uh, everywhere were, everywhere that we looked at, we encountered these big uh, um, publicity campaign. Um, uh, Akkuyu Nuclear. Akkuyu is the place where the first nuclear plant is being built right now by mm. the Russians, actually. Um, and they started this big publicity campaign. So uh, up until this point, Akkuyu nuclear power plant was an idea that was far away, was far away from us. But with the publicity campaign, the nuclear became a daily reality mm -hmm. that we had to uh, encounter. And I felt like we have to say uh, something about it. We have to discuss this issue in Turkey. You said it's a hot topic in the beginning, but it's really a, a, it's not a hot topic in the sense mm. that it's not being talked about. But it should be. But it should be. So our intention is to hopefully uh, bring this issue of the nuclear in Turkey uh, into uh, the public uh, discussion. Um, and, uh, and, and to do this, we're asking this question. Turkey is about to become, for the first time in its history, a country that produces uh, nuclear energy and nuclear waste. How did we come to this point and where do we want to go from here? And uh, because it's really a nuclear threshold uh, that we are at right now. Um, and and, and we're, we're trying to collect nuclear stories of Turkey. Mm. Uh, and um, so in a way, look at our past, the nuclear past, so that we can imagine our nuclear future. And we think that our nuclear future should be um, a nuclear-free Turkey. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I really hope so. And I hope the documentary creates that dialogue because like you said, it's a really, it's a critical moment. It's a threshold and it has to be talked about. Yeah, but like many things in Turkey, unfortunately, that's not part of the public discussion at the mm-hmm. moment. Yeah. Um, but it should be. Yeah, definitely. So I have one more question for you, and it's a bit of a hard one. So we all know that the situation in Turkey has been quite dire in many ways for quite a while. And at the same time, regular people and social movements continue to resist. And as we talked about with documentary, you know, art and culture can have a role in this, whether it's film or music or uh, songs, other things. So I'm curious if you can tell us about any developments or or movements or or projects that uh give you hope or inspire you from the realm of art and culture mm-hmm. in Turkey today mm-hmm. well um despite uh the fact that we're living uh, through we're going through a difficult time in Turkey in terms of the freedom of speech freedom of expression artistic expression every day almost we're hearing about a, a story of censorship um despite all 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 these kind of um um demoralizing news i i feel like people are resisting in their own ways and uh, and and as you said art and culture is is one of those areas in which uh, i think we see a lot of activity in 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 turkey um and um it's difficult to point to just one example maybe but i feel like um when uh there is a uh, pressure on freedom of expression uh, artistic expression etc people find creative ways of going around it true um and uh, i also get a lot of inspiration from uh, for example the women's movement uh despite all the um um, um oppression uh women's movement is still very alive and strong in turkey and uh, you never know when something in a way will uh kind of uh, uh, inspire more people to express themselves like what's happening in iran right now for mm. example is i think it's very inspiring as well but um so uh, i think it's it, it's it's important to uh look at different social movements and also uh, look at what we have accomplished in the past to maybe uh, get motivated uh and and work um to in a way build a build a better future and uh, or at least to survive through these uh difficult times um i you know i mean there i see a lot of uh activity in the areas of uh art and and, and culture um that that i think i find quite inspirational i mean i i find it difficult to maybe name one or two but But I think as a whole, um, that's, I think, where the resistance is happening, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today. It was great talking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. My pleasure.